Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Yeah, I love it when I get convicted and I get nervous because I I just know the Holy Spirit says, do something radical. And I'm expected. I was expected in the nine and sometimes I get in my own way and I have to get that Holy Spirit kick. And then he kind of pulls me aside and says, no. And uh, we're, we're gonna, it's Pentecost Sunday, which means that today is a day if we're ever gonna do what the word says, if we're ever gonna be true to the word, if we're ever gonna be bold, this was the day that launched that movement. And I'm, I wanna launch that movement uh, in myself, but actually I wanna look, Troy, yeah, I was, Troy, I saw your hands up, but I saw your hands up in worship above anything and just absolutely highlighted. And I know because I know you, we have a little bit of a dialogue relationship. I know you're launching a business, but the word I got for you today is that you are going to be an influencer, but not on the sphere in which you're comfortable. You're gonna be influencing on a sphere which actually pulls you out of comfort. You are gonna be a, the, let's put it this way. The word of God coming out of your mouth is going to change lives. It's gonna be a word of transformation and it's gonna start in your business. You're gonna see opportunities from media streams and I'm not talking, it's not a media stream. You're not gonna get a social media stream. You're gonna actually get a river. It's actually gonna be an abundant. You're gonna create waves over the entire nation. You're gonna infiltrate that, that community, that sport in which you are and you're going to bring light to it on a level that you have no idea and it launches it launches with your business it will be blessed by God all of your partners are going to be blessed equally as well your relationship your beautiful marriage sir is going to be blessed but that's because you are true to the word and you are faith first and I commend you for that so and then I'm not going to lie, this one, I'm, this one gets me a little bit. Uh, beautiful in the gray shirt. I don't know you there. Yep, you, you, you don't turn around. It's you. Yes. Um, I don't know, and it doesn't take a prophet, it doesn't take a word of God to uh, recognize that there is something that the devil has thrown at you. And seeing you in worship and seeing you in prayer, I recognize that, you've lost sleep, you've lost peace. It's, you've been struggling at night and it's been unfair. And the Lord says, I can reverse this, I can flip this. Not only did he sacrifice on the cross for our sin, but actually before that he had his body punished. And the Lord said, because my body was punished, I exchanged that for you. So I speak supernatural healing over you right now. I declare that you will have all your rest restored. You will have supernatural peace at night where you felt that something has been stolen. God is gonna continue to redeem that. And I also feel it's not just on a physical, but there's also this spiritual, like you've been waiting in a season, waiting in a season. And the Lord says, I'm going to turn that season today. It's gonna to start with tonight. It's gonna to start with this evening where you're gonna be able to breathe again. You're gonna be able to relax again, but then you're gonna be able to dream again. The visions are gonna come back. The excitement's gonna come back. The best is still ahead of you. Do not be discouraged because the Lord sees you, loves you, and he's going to pick you up supernaturally under his, his wind will fill your wings and you're going and it's all coming back to you. And I just believe that's already happening right now right now. So thank you, Lord, for healing your daughter. Thank you for loving her. Thank you for taking her entire, you know, every desire of her heart. We ask you, Holy Spirit, minister, and we shift it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wow. Well, we have departed my notes already, so please give your neighbor a high five. Give, the, give us a round of applause for our amazing worship team, and let's get back to those seats. 
It's, al- it's already a start. It's, are, you, are you expecting? Are you expecting today? I mean, I, I was feeling something in the nine o'clock, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling a lot more encouraged right now. I'm feeling that, that today that there is a fiery word. There's something specific that the Lord wants to get across, and it's really a privilege that I get to be here and share it with you. Uh, as, as the introduction was, I, I am a 20-year military veteran. Okay. I'll receive that. I will receive that. Let, let me continue before you, like some of you are going to stop clapping. I'm a 20-year military veteran in the Coast Guard. Where, okay, okay. Right now, you don't know, but there's like some Marines across there. They're like, that's not even a service, is it? So, so do understand, I spent 20 years of my service actually not what was conventional. I joined thinking that I was gonna be on Baywatch. I did not see, I did not see a single beach the entire time I was there. I spent the majority of my time in another military uniform on a Navy ship, in an Air Force base. I have been, have the privilege of being trained by just about every other military service, including some of my own. But I would say that I am probably a bilingual or a multilingual military guy because I went to Fort Bragg. I did jump school. I went and I trained with the Air Force at their school. I've had a lot of different opportunities. And so you think, okay, that's why the military guy's here, because it's a memorial weekend service. And that is part of it. And let's pause, and let's actually honor, how amazing is it that our pastors who came not from the United States, actually make a point to take time and pause and recognize that the freedoms that we're enjoying right now, were, they, they weren't free. They cost so much. They cost lives of generations and generations. We have amazing pastors that pause and say, you know what? I will take a minute and say that the word of God wants us to edify, highlight, and appreciate them. That is what I think leadership should be. That's what church leadership should be. So if you agree, let's give our pastors a round of applause. (laughs) Pastor Jorgen and Pastor Leanne, also our regional pastors, the Hubbards. This is important to them, and it should be. It absolutely should be. And I love that we take time and we're always honoring veterans. We shouldn't wait until Veterans Day to honor our veterans because they're not waiting for one day to take care of us. Uh, We don't only worship the Lord on Sunday. If you do, see me after. We're going to have some conversation on that too. We are a church of honor and we are a church of respect and we are a respecter of that the freedoms that we have aren't being They're not even happening right now, even in San Diego. There is churches right now in our own community. There's churches in your community online there that they won't even pause and recognize. So that already tells you that you are in a good flow of leadership is because we know and we honor, and I'm so proud to be there. Now, the other reason why I'm here, military, yes, some saying maybe, the other portion is because I have been a study and I have been in discipleship. I, I was more pirate than I was anything else. I mean, I definitely was more pirate than preacher about seven years ago. And I came into this house, and I came into this house by way of, uh, well, first off, my beautiful wife, Michelle, who was praying for me and tithing for me before I even understood the principle. But then... I had a great friend who brought me in, who I used to work with in the service, and he's a master, he was a master chief. He's also now a pastor at this amazing church. I had, once I had come into the doors, I became a good study. I started recognizing that there was something on my life that wasn't in alignment with where it should have been, and so I started this path of discipleship. And the path is never easy. In fact, navigating your discipleship is one of the hardest things to do. It's very easy for us to get off course. And I say that because in uh, nautical terms, we have a 1 to 60 rule. The 1 to 60 rule is that for every 60 miles that you travel, if your compass is off by 1 degree, you will be off by an additional nautical mile. So let me, let me rephrase that. If I'm going to go to Hawaii 
because I would love, hi, Hawaii, by the way. Welcome, thank you for joining us. If I wanna go join you at Hawaii and I have one degree off on my compass, I will miss Hawaii by over 40 miles. I can't even see it on the horizon at that point. I don't even know where I am. And if you've ever sailed to Hawaii or taken a plane, you don't look at anything. There's nothing under there. It's very easy for one degree to completely deviate your course. Now, I will tell you that my path to kingdom, my path to heaven, I don't even have a compass that points which way is north. I have to go out of faith, but I also take the time to take discipleship, and I take the time and the experience from others to allow me to make sure that I can get from where I was to where I'm supposed to be. All right. Let me bring it in here because I think some of you are already starting to fall asleep, so I need to amplify. Are you right now where you think you're supposed to be going? Are you already at your destination? Have you already achieved your fullest potential? I can tell you from the pulpit right here, I have not. But if you have, come on down here. I might just give you the mic and you're gonna tell me how you achieved it. But the reality is that as soon as God knew us in the womb, he cast us. We've been filling that same mold all the way, and we will until he calls us back. It means that the best life that you are supposed to be living is still ahead of you. It means you haven't achieved it, and most of the time, it's our choices that prevent us from getting there. So with what little time I have remaining, we're going to spend the time, and we're going to discuss navigating your ship. I'm gonna give you a couple of elements. I'm gonna give you a couple of things that I want you to ask yourself because if you're not taking time to ask yourself, where are you on your discipleship? You still have no idea where you're going. Nobody wants to just float around wherever the tide takes you because that's just gonna take you nowhere. But if you take up the journey of discipleship, if you start following the word, you are going to go to that life more abundantly. And you say, well, what does that destination look like? That destination is pressed down, shaken together, pouring over, cherry on top. Your destination in discipleship is that, that life more abundantly that I keep talking about. It's supposed to be miraculous. You're supposed to have an unfair advantage over everything else in the world, over everything, because when you're in line with this, the supernatural happens. And when I start talking about abundantly, I know a lot of times we go, oh, he's talking about money again. There's that prosperity thing. And the reality is, is if you automatically go to money, when I talk about abundance and prosperity and pouring over, shaking together, yes, we tithe on those principles, but what is your metric of value? What is your metric of value? I I would say that a more abundant life cares less about the thickness of the wallet and it cares more about the riches of the heart. So if you have an abundant life, those items in your world are gonna start multiplying. You're gonna start seeing signs and wonders. You're gonna see healings. So you're gonna see salvations. You're gonna see God stories. Oh, the byproduct is that provision, is that abundance. And guess what? You can take it and you can turn it right then and there. So if you're feeling like, oh, he's gonna talk about money, I'm not. I'm gonna talk about what's in here because I want this to take you to your fullest potential. All right, this is a little encouragement. Some people are awake, front rows awake. How are we doing in the back over here? There we go. That's the San Marcos I love. I love home campus. All right, our first element to navigating our discipleship is leadership. Leadership, you have to know who is in your boat. And actually the reality is, is you are responsible for who is in your boat. When we look at Luke 5, uh, verse 1 through 3, it says, One day Jesus was standing by Lake Genesaret, which is a really cool way of saying the Sea of Galilee. Uh, The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little bit from shore, and then he sat down and taught people from the boat. As we carry on, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon kind of rebuked and said, master, we've been working all night and we haven't caught anything yet. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. 
there's a couple of things. Is when, when you think about this moment in time and coming fresh from Israel, standing on the exact same shore, being able to see the Sea of Galilee, which um, if you don't know, the sea is what we call a lake. It's not that big. It's really, it's beautiful, but it's really small. In fact, all the area around it is really small, which where we can look at the Bible and we can say, hey, this is a very vast and a long journey. It was actually really intimate. Um, Jesus had already met Simon because earlier when he arrived, he went to Simon's house and he helped cure his mother-in-law. And then she began to immediately serve. And so Jesus has already done works in this area, but he never had that direct with Simon. Simon sat back and he kind of looked at him. Now, if I were to hop into your Tesla this afternoon and you don't know me, are we going to have a beef? Are we going to have a problem? I would hope so, because in, in this situation, that ship isn't necessarily a mode of transportation, but that's the livelihood. It's the livelihood. When you were a fisherman back then, your father was a fisherman. Your father's father was a fisherman, and so on and so on. It, your great-great-grandfather probably built that boat out of his own hands. He tied every net together. And so when you are a fisherman, you don't entrust that lightly. But Simon saw something. He heard something. And so even though Jesus hopped into the boat, Jesus was a respecter of persons. And he said, hey, why don't you put out a little bit so I can speak? And Simon complied. Simon made a choice. Are you making the choice? Is Jesus trying to get into your boat, but you're too busy over here on your phone because this is easy and this takes effort? Who is in your boat today? You are the captain of your vessel. It's up to you to decide if you're going to make way and head out or you can just stay in in the shallow water like us Coast Guardsmen like to do, so they say. <laughs> Who is in your boat? You know, if you were to continue on with that scripture, uh, obviously we know that there was a ton of fish came in. Everybody was amazed. But then at the end, Jesus offered to take them and make them fisher of men. And it said that after that, they let everything away and they left with him. He was a fisherman. His father was a fisherman. His whole world revolved around the identity of he was a fisherman. But good discipleship and the Lord will pull you out of where you think you are and will show you really where you're supposed to go. Don't hesitate to bring the Lord into your boat. Don't hesitate to bring a church community into your boat. You are the captain of the vessel. Are you going to get underway or are you going to stay where it's safe? Does that one, did that hit for somebody? Somebody need to hear it. All right, we're going to continue on. Also along that is uh, in that same scripture, we found out Jesus, or, uh, Jesus was in the boat, but Simon wasn't alone. Also in the boat, he had a couple of the other disciples with him. Notice that Jesus didn't disciple one individual. He didn't say, hey, yo, you're going to be my rock. They're not the rock. I want, I want to go with the rock. I know what you're going to do. Let's not worry about them. He didn't focus all his effort onto one individual. He actually took several. How many disciples did we bring? Eventually 12. In this instant, there was just the three to the four, but it ended up being 12. So the next element of navigating your discipleship is your fellowship. It takes a crew to sail the ship. In fact, the purpose of discipleship is not so you can have a relationship with your pastor. It's not so you can only have a relationship with God. It's because you need a relationship with everybody else. What's going to happen? What's going to happen on your path? If you start getting alignment here and you're getting wisdom, you're going to start changing. For me, I've been working on my abs for the last about 20 years. I haven't seen one yet. I, I'm trying. I need to go see my friends Troy over here. I've been trying, but I can go and I can hit the cardio and I can go hit the weights. And what's funny is I will look in the mirror and I will see the exact same thing that I was three, four, five weeks ago. But it is somebody from outside who looks at me and says, hey, have you been working out again? 
hey, you're looking really, you're looking a little bit more cut. What are you doing? Are you eating right? See, what will happen is change takes a lot, and we are such hard critics, is that the change in which you are actually experiencing, you might have scales to see but your fellowship will see it. Your fellowship will say, hey, I love that you're becoming a prayer warrior, Daniel. You, you are not afraid to be bold for Christ. You're not afraid to invite nearly every person you meet back into this church. The teams that you lead are expanding so big, I would be a little bit jealous, but I'm gonna take the win with you. That is exactly what a friend and fellowship does. It looks over here and it looks and says, hey, I see you, Pathfinders. I see what you have done and you've unlocked in so many, including myself. And I'm going to continue to promote that and I'm going to edify that because if you don't see it, I want you to know God does and so do I. Fellowship is designed because they actually see the gold in you when you are too blind to see it. You need fellowship. All right. There are some things to worry about fellowship, though, because obviously you're responsible for who's in your boat, which also means the crew you take, you might want to make sure you're checking them first. You, you don't want to go. If you're struggling with tithing, and I'm not doing this to convict anybody or condemn anybody, but if you're struggling with tithing, and you say, you know what, my friend Sally over here, she does not go to church. She actually doesn't believe in the Lord, but you know what, I think her wisdom is worth listening to. Who's gonna have the best insight on whether I should up my vision builders or not? Sally is gonna say, uh, just give me the money. Don't just give, just give me the money. You need to make sure that those who are in the boat And those who are in your fellowship are on a path of discipleship too. You don't want to get somebody into the boat who's not willing to bail water a little bit, who's not willing to plug a hole a little bit, or maybe pick up the oars and paddle a little bit, because what will happen is you'll be in the boat by yourself doing all the work, and they'll jump ship the first chance they can. You need fellowship that edifies the Lord, that edifies your spirit, that sees the gold, and is unwilling to let it just be. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, I love it. It's in the word. It's in the word. All right. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12, is the value of the friend. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him and a threefold. You need fellowship. And I love that in our house in Awaken, fellowship is the norm. We have avenues of fellowship. You should be in a connect group. If you're not in a connect group, it's time. And I'm sorry, you know, if you want to tell me that well, I'm a little introverted. I understand that that is a personality. That is not a box and that is not, that, that is a tendency to be. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit is not introverted. So you just go and watch what the Holy Spirit will edify and bring out. You will have familiarity around you. You will have family or people will become family around you. We have connect groups. We have prayer groups. We have Awaken You. We have Pathfinders. We have Heroes Ministries. We have So many opportunities because it's not good to be alone. Let me ask you, are you filling your boat? Have you been the invite? It's time to take inventory and let's get your crew going. Paul had Silas. Tim had Paul. Moses had his father-in-law, Jethro. Don't sail without your crew. Make sure you're filling your boat. Let's get an amen. Can I go here? Are we ready? All right. <laughs> we're going to talk about we're going to talk about stewardship. Because stewardship is probably the thing that actually we struggle with the most. If you're going to place people into your lives, if you're going to be the captain of your vessel, you're going to have to trust those that you empower. 
you're going to have to trust yourself to make a move. And you're going to have to be able to continue on because it is expected. When you're the captain, you are in charge. It is your duty. So why would you jump into discipleship, set sail, and quit? It happens more often than not. Another word for stewardship is duty or obligation. And when we're navigating discipleship, you're going to find out things aren't always going to be smooth sailing. There's going to be some waves. There's going to be some wind. There's going to be a little bit of water. It's going to get rocky. And if you get seasick, it's okay. You have to have good stewardship. And this is the thing where we actually struggle the most. Because what happens, and for me, this is probably the area that I struggle the most. Um, I've been blessed to be employed by this church for three solid years right now. I've been in this church for about nine years, almost 10. And the journey that I've had has taken me some time. But even as I got employed, I thought I had arrived. I thought I was there. Um, aside from maybe having a microphone and being able to share on the word, I felt I was smooth sailing. But After 20 years of a military career, one that was a little bit more unique, I spent a lot of time doing counter-drug operations. I spent a lot of time doing counter-piracy operations, even though I said I kind of was a pirate. (laughs) Uh, A little bit of contradiction there. (laughs) Not every day that I served was a day that is worth sharing and talking about. Not every day brought joy. Um, I have lost friends along the way. I have lost family members along the way. Uh, even when I was expecting it because I, I was able to go on two tours to the Middle East and Iraq for uh, war deployments. I spent a lot of my time down in South and Central America. When I even expected it was the times where I actually felt more lost and, and there was more tragedy. Um, it wasn't too long after I had joined there was an operation that I was second in command of. The commander stayed with the Navy vessel. And for me, I took our team out, and we would go and board this drug smuggling vessel. But as we were on our way to that vessel, what had happened is they had decided that it was better to sink the ship and jump overboard before we would go and catch them doing something illegal. And how they did this is they kept their engines running, and this is about a 100-foot vessel. It's relatively small. They dumped over about 55 gallons of gasoline. They cut all the seawater lines so that the water levels were rising, and then they tried to set this delayed timer. The problem is is that when you strike a match to set the delayed fuse and there's expanded gases from gasoline that has now raised to the level of the generator, a massive explosion happened. Uh, we went over there thinking that we were going to be Captain America. We thought we were going to be you know, doing something worthy of you know, television, of the movie theaters. It was our moment. And instead, we actually spent our time trying to keep 14 crew members of that vessel alive. Uh, at that time, I had sent most of the team to keep the ship available because we had, we had to keep it afloat. And then I went through with the Navy crew, and we just started lifting bodies up. We were able to resuscitate all said for one that we lost. And I never recognized that that was something I held on to. I never recognized that the other traumas that I had, I held on to. I was in New York during 9-11. I lost a family member during a deployment. All these things... I thought that I had dealt with because I came up here to the altar. But when I came to the altar and I gave them to the Lord, I also buried them inside myself. So the discipleship part was when things started to come out because I gave myself permission to feel again, my leaders recognized that I was struggling. Uh, We call it, the military and doctors will call it PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. I will tell you, I'm not a big believer in PTSD as I say PTS. I say PTS because if you include the Lord, it does not become a disorder. I will say that again. 
It becomes a disorder when you keep it inside of you and you don't work and process it with others and you don't bring it to the Lord. And I had to have my boss come to me and say, you need therapy. I'm sorry, I'm an alpha male, military veteran, been to Iraq twice. I mean, I was running around with more guns than you'll see over at El Cajon. And I have to go to a therapist. I was so offended. I was so, I was ready to jump ship, start paddling back to the shore, run away, because you know what? They didn't get me. They didn't understand me. But something inside of me said yes. Something inside of me said, it's time to say yes. And I said, okay, if you think so, I'll do it. I'm here today because my leaders refused to stop when it got a little bit hard. They continued to press, and they taught me how to be a good steward so that I continued to focus on the word that I actually was able to process, that I was able to communicate. And I will tell you, my life is more abundantly today. I get to enjoy, yeah, you can clap to that. I will, I will clap to that. My life is more abundantly today because all of the things that I held inside, all of the hardships, all the fear, all the trauma, I've been able to process. And there are days where it's still hard, but somebody looked at me and said, no, I draw the line. You have to do this. You must go and seek a little bit more help and attention because I believe in you. Too often we stop right there. Too often somebody had a conversation or what we call a care confrontation or a correction because we care. Somebody stopped you because it got a little dicey. If it's true discipleship, they only do it because they love you. Often when we start talking about putting friends in the boat, we tend to just put the folks in there that we feel will tell us what we want to hear. When you start doing that, you bring people into your community who will tell you what you want to hear because you stopped listening to what you were supposed to hear. He has a word for you. He can walk you through this. He can communicate with it further. Don't just focus on the worldly friends. You need to bring in your church community. And when it gets dicey, don't go back. What's the point to have to start over again? Press forward. Lean in. Grab the hand. Tighten the rigging and sail through that storm because God's promise is still on the other side. Luke 17, one through four, then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him in a mill, if a millstone was hung around his neck and if he were thrown into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. This is the important part. Take heed yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, which means challenge him, share, communicate, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him again. We often in discipleship hold on to the one bad day of sailing, and then it starts turning to unforgiveness. It starts turning to strife. It starts turning into something we're not supposed to be sailing with. Don't let your ship sink from a little link, a leak. Keep pressing forward. Communicate. Don't hold on to the offense. Hold on to the promise. That is good stewardship. The final thing we're going to land is we're going to land on the element of relationship. Make sure your compass is oriented to God. Make sure that you know that it is pointed to that true north. Don't get focused on the worldly. Don't let those offenses sway your vision 
Make sure you're postured back to who you should. In Psalms 119, 133, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me for human oppression that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your degree, your decrees. Discipleship, it is equal parts of learning, living, and teaching. If you aren't in that position where you're learning, living, and teaching, it's Pentecost Sunday. It's the day where Jesus said, I have showed you everything, now you go out and do. What better day to not talk about passionate about discipleship and start being action on discipleship. Steer your ship, navigate it to where God has you going. I guarantee your journey will well be worth it. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.